Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat Pilipinas. Good morning Philippines. Good evening. This is Teresa Pantoversosa. Good evening uh, Seattle. Good evening America. This is Dr. Jude. Today is October 16, October 17 there. And um, we have come full circle. Yes. Full circle because back in May, we asked the blessings of um, our uh, spiritual mentor, Bishop Pablo Virgilio David, to uh, see how we could help um, kind of evangelize, kind of put a positive spin to all the negativity in social media. He was our pilot for that day. And um, with God's grace, October 16, what a special day because we have Bishop as yes. our guest. But before I go on, um, I'd like to ask the, may I? I'd like to ask the viewers, today we're trying to raise uh, $10. And to do so, you could help us by sending stars. Stars on Facebook are like, I think it's a penny. It's one cent. See, if you send uh, 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 five stars, we get five cents. And if we could raise $10 uh, for our mission and for our ministry, if you could help give us that support. Or if not, if, you don't, if, if that's not your thing, that's also okay. Prayers are very much um, appreciated. Anyway, this is great. This is great. So would you like to yes. introduce um, Bishop? Yes. As sinabi po ni Jude, gusto po namin magtagalog, but for some people who are listeners and tuning in, at hindi sila maroon magtagalog, hindi sila nakaintindi ng tagalog, we would like to maybe half-half. Right. Pero Jude said, uh, Bishop Ambo was our pilot. I... I Suddenly, I just said, you know, he's not just a pilot in pilot episode, but he's actually a spiritual pilot. So anyway, I am honored to, to read to you the little bio of which we got from the internet, but we would love for Bishop Ambo to talk and share with us, with everyone who is on board and listening about his life as a priest up until now. So let me read a little bit of what we're able to concise. Bishop Ambos is a heavyweight, you know? It, 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 I don't think one page will, no. will, will be enough, or probably will not finish. So I'll try to make it as concise as possible. Bishop Pablo Virgilio David was born in Betis, Guagua, Pampanga. See? Yeah. Kapampangan po siya katulad ko. So madaldal ako. I don't know. Bishop Ambo is not really madaldal, is he? <laughs> so anyway. Um, uh, anyway, so pareho po kami kapampangan. In the Archdiocese of San Fernando on March 2, 1959. That's his birthday. He attended secondary school at the Mother of Good Counsel Minor Seminary. He did philosophy studies at the Ateneo de Manila University and his theology course at the Loyola School of Theology. He was ordained a priest March 12, 1983 for the Archdiocese of San Fernando. After a year as an assistant parish priest, he was a director of the Mother of Good Counsel Seminary until 1986. From 1986 to 1991, he studied for licentiate and, a lady, and later a doctorate in sacred theology at the Catholic University of Louvain, Belgium. But I know that um, uh, this Ecole Biblique in Jerusalem, Bishop, just later tell us about that. I know that you had your studies there too. After returning to his country, he held various offices of teaching within the educational team at the Archdiocesan Seminary in Mater Boni, Mother of Good Counsel. So he's back in San Fernando. In 2002, he became director of the Department of Theology at the seminary, continuing to teach sacred scriptures. In 2012, he was elected vice president of the Association of Catholic Biblical Scholars of the Philippines and vice president of the Archdiocese and Media Apostolate Networks. On May 27, 2006, he was appointed titular bishop of Guardia Fiera, an auxiliary bishop of San Fernando Pampanga by Pope Benedict XVI. And on September 14, 2015, he became the new bishop of Caloca and by Pope Francis. Within the Episcopal Conference of the Philippines, he is the president of the Episcopal Commission for the Biblical Apostolate. Currently, he's also the vice president and acting president of the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines, CBCP. Bishop Ambo, as he is fondly called, is recognized as one of the most prominent biblical scholars and professors of scriptures in the Philippines and around the world. But he is more known to me and to so many, and I know yung mga nakikinig na uh, 
uh, drug war survivors to be the great defender of the poor, particularly in his diocese in Caloocan, the epicenter of drug war, and calls the drug war as illegal, immoral, and anti-poor. And I like to call him the shepherd of the slaughtered sheep and those who are fighting to stay alive. So please help me welcome into our homes and into your homes, our very good friend, our spiritual brother, spiritual father, someone who have known since I was 15 years old. So you can tell a lot about our age. Please welcome His Excellency, Most Reverend Bishop Pablo David of the Diocese of Caloacan. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you. Thank you Jude and uh, Therese for having me. Yeah, um, you know, people might be wondering why my name is uh, Pablo Virgilio David, but you keep calling me Ambo. Yeah, the, in the Philippines, Ambo is a nickname for uh, a Pablo. When you are Pablo, uh, you can you are called Ambo. But I fell in love with the name. Uh, I fell in love with that name because I uh, found out later on that uh, Ambo uh, means something very special in the Catholic Church. It is the stand from which the word of God is proclaimed. I think I mentioned that the first time I guested with you. So hello, I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, thank you, thank God for giving us this opportunity to meet uh, each other, one another again, albeit virtually. Totoo po, totoo. Well, do you want to read us in prayer before we, we start? Oh, I thought it will be at the end. Uh, oh, okay. Whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> 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 then you want to lead? Okay. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, maraming salamat po for this opportunity to be with our spiritual shepherd, Apong Ambo, or Bishop Ambo, or Bishop Pablo David. Thank you for this sacred moment. And we offer it back to you, O Lord, because this moment is for everyone, for all of the Philippines and all of the nations listening to in just for this one hour. Please, Lord, let the Holy Spirit come upon Bishop Ambo and us and everyone, every family was listening and tuning in so that whatever we are learning today can be lived by our lives so that uh, in the end, Lord, our destination, which is heaven, we can all proclaim that we are the body of Christ, not just here on earth, but in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for this. Amen. Amen. In the name Amen. of the Father, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Jesus. Spirit. Amen. Okay. Right. Well, folks, um, today, uh, our we chose the topic in particular, holy orders and, on, and uh, the sacrament of matrimony, the two sacraments of services for uh, a couple of reasons. One, uh, I feel that service in this time is something that we really need to emphasize. It's a great insight into the life uh, of the priests and those uh, of the flock, particularly of the life of Bishop Ambo, but also because we are celebrating our 22nd wedding anniversary. <laughs> this Great. October 18th. Happy anniversary, yes. That's <laughs> Salamat po. Salamat po. So, Bishop, there has to be a backstory po. Hindi po ba? Your calling to priesthood. It always starts somewhere. Uh, one must first recognize the calling. You, you might want to tell us that story po. I know it's very inspirational. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, you know, um, I was ordained uh, to the presbyteral ministry in uh, Mar uh, on March 12, 1983. And uh, I think the setting of my call to participate in the priesthood of uh, Christ, the ministerial priesthood, uh, was really uh, in a very concrete context. And that context uh, was the social upheaval that was taking place in the Philippines uh, in the late 70s and the 1980s. Uh, that is why, uh, you know, I was uh, brought up differently <laughs> because... Uh, our kind of formation was uh, really immersed, immersed in the social realities. And uh, I happened to be, uh, uh, to undergo a serious formation and training uh, by the Jesuits of uh, Manila, of the Loyola School of Theology and San Jose Seminary. Um, so uh, that sort of defines uh, the kind of priestly ministry that uh, I found myself in, in 1983. Um, you know, uh, during that time, uh, we did not want uh, our priestly formation to be exclusively academic. You know? uh, I think we were already awakening gradually to what uh, St. John Paul II would call a four-dimensional formation, you know, that included uh, human formation, spiritual formation, intellectual formation and pastoral formation. It had to be uh, more holistic, yeah. 
Well, um, that's it. I, I think I spoke about my, uh, my early vocation as a seminarian. Perhaps now we can just dwell on the, the priesthood itself. You know? yes. um, because when I got ordained to the priesthood, my immediate calling was formation. You know? um, the archbishop who ordained me was Archbishop Oscar Cruz. And uh, during the time that he was the Archbishop of San Fernando, Pampanga, he felt the need to establish a major seminary uh, so that our own priests could be homegrown already, uh, trained and formed by our own priests in the diocese. And uh, yeah, uh, he succeeded in putting up a whole faculty. It was very expensive, of course, because he had to make sure that uh, his formators were professionally trained as well. And, um, well, actually, I was uh, resisting to the idea of becoming an academic, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I thought that maybe if I, uh, if I was going to be sent for further studies abroad, that would get me uh, sort of chained to the academic setting. And, uh, you know, a priest is ordained for the Christian community. It's like you feel that uh, your priesthood is not complete until you have become a pastor, uh, you know, immersed in the life conditions of, your, of, of the Christian communities. Um, but, uh, you know, because that was the need, uh, I had to respond. I, I responded positively to the invitation of uh, Archbishop Cruz for me to specialize in biblical studies. Uh, because I started as a professor of philosophy uh, and then uh, also theology and uh, and biblical courses. And then uh, the Archbishop, the late Archbishop, by the way, he died recently. You know? uh, mm -hmm. The late Archbishop said, uh, I want to make sure that you are professionally trained in the field of expertise that uh, uh, you are called to serve in. And he says, if it is biblical studies for you, then uh, I want to make sure that you are professionally trained in uh, biblical scholarship. And so um, he sent me uh, to do my uh, licentiate and uh, doctorate, the, my doctoral work. Uh, I, I did my own masteral uh, studies at the Loyola School of Theology. Um, and, and my focus then was the theology of the ordained ministry of holy orders. Yeah. Uh, during that time, uh, the, the theologian Edward Skilibates uh, was becoming notorious, you know. And so I chose that as a topic, the theology of ministry uh, in the mind of the theologian Edward, uh, Edward Skilibakes. Um, and I finished that in 1984. Then I had to be sent to Belgium to do my licentiate in uh, 1986. Licentiate and, uh, you know, my, my, my licentiate thesis was about, uh, the, uh, about resurrection in the book of Daniel. The first time that uh, the Jews are opening up to the idea of an afterlife, of, uh, uh, of uh, resurrection, resurrection, final judgment, you know, all of that is, uh, uh, is a new development because Judaism uh, at first did not believe in afterlife. You know, um, the earlier Israelite faith did not really profess faith in, uh, etern uh, in an afterlife, in a resurrection, or even in the existence of, of uh, angels, you know. That's why up to the time of Jesus, there were debates, you know, about, mm -hmm. about this issue. Well, uh, like you were saying, I, I was also trained in Jerusalem uh, because I interrupted my uh, doctoral studies with research work in the biblical school, uh, the very well-known school of the Dominicans, you know. Uh, the Biblical School of the Dominicans is called the École Biblique Archéologique Française de Jerusalem. So I spent one year in Jerusalem uh, specializing in biblical studies also. Uh, they could not allow me to enroll only as a researcher, so I had to be a degree student as well. So I had to accomplish the degree uh, élève titulaire, you know, and that's... Uh, uh, and, that forced me also to learn French because all the lectures were in French, you know. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And from there, I returned to Belgium again to complete my doctoral studies. And I defended my dissertation in 1990, December of 1990, and returned to the Philippines in 1991. 
And uh, again, you know, the, the social context when I returned was the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and there was uh, something wonderful happening in the Philippine church because the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines back then had called for uh, our equivalent of Second Vatican Council in the Philippines, you know, mm -hmm. to localize Vatican II uh, in the Second Plenary Council of the Philippines that took place in 1991. And then, of course, the rest uh, was uh, uh, formation work, you know, in the seminary. That's how my, uh, my own priestly uh, life uh, and ministry happened. Um, yeah, and much of it was spent really in Pampanga. Yeah, uh, until I, I, I became a bishop. And that's going to be the, the second part of this sharing, you know. Uh, do you want me to proceed immediately? Oh, yeah. oh, let us, uh, tell us about your episcopacy. Um, uh, Bishop, you have, you have the microphone. <laughs> you, you can talk as long as you want. Because the, the listeners are not here for us. <laughs> we, we are, we yeah. Yes. yeah, Therese called me madaldal a while ago. Because, uh, <laughs> no, I said to you, I don't know if I'm madaldal. I said to well, uh, well it's, it's a very kapampangan trait, you know. Yeah, so um, much of my life was really spent as formator. Uh, I spent 12 years of my life as a seminary professor and formator. And uh, it was there that I realized that uh, formation work was also pastoral, you know. Yeah, you know, uh, to lead a community is uh, to do shepherding work, you know. So, it's not only people who are sent to parishes who can be considered pastoral. Although I made sure that, that during the weekends uh, of those years that I was doing formation work, that I was also immersed in the pastoral condition of our parishes in Pampanga. I was ordained bishop in 2006, and uh, none of that was uh, uh, foreseen at all, you know. Uh, in fact, I, I was sort of resistant to the idea, you know, I, I, I said to the nuncio, uh, you know, you, you, the archdiocese spent a lot of resources to send me for studies in order to become a formator, and now you're calling me to become a bishop, I said. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, uh, it's not fair also to, to the seminary. It's not fair to the diocese also, you know, I was sort of saying things like those, and then, and then uh, the nuncio said, uh, but we also need teachers, you know, uh, in, in the episcopacy. Said, uh, and uh, but I, I was lamenting about the fact that I was very much lacking in pastoral experience. And then he said, "Well, that's never too late because even as bishop, you can have your pastoral experience, you know, because I was appointed as an auxiliary bishop. I was not immediately appointed as a bishop of my own diocese." Well, I became titular bishop of a diocese in Italy, mm -hmm. but that was titular, you know, uh, because uh, they say in principle, every bishop should have his own diocese. And because I was being ordained as an assistant bishop uh, uh, to a diocese whose bishop is the archbishop, you know, I had to be given a title, a titular see, a titular diocese. That's another story. Uh, Guardia Fiera in Italy, which I visited two times, you know, very interesting, very interesting experience. But anyway, uh, yeah, surprisingly, my first few years as a bishop became very, very pastoral, really. I became a pastor in my own parish, uh, first uh, uh, in uh, Transfiguration Parish in San Fernando, Pampanga, and later on, the rest of the time, in uh, Holy Rosary Parish in Angeles City. And those were wonderful, wonderful years of pastoral uh, experience while I was assisting the bishop in administrative and pastoral duties in the Archdiocese because I was also serving as a curia moderator at the same time. Um, you know, I was ordained uh, by Cardinal Rosales, and mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, July 10. And, it, you know, July gets to be very rainy in the Philippines, and our cathedral in Pampanga is very small, you know. So uh, it was then that uh, with the consent of Archbishop Aniceto, I was <coughs> ordained instead at the Manila Cathedral. Uh, 
uh, and and that week happened to be uh, the plenary assembly of the Catholic Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines it made it much easier for the bishops to attend. That is why I had, I think, about 65 bishops, you know, concelebrating at my uh, episcopal ordination, which was presided by Cardinal Gaudencio Rosales, the then Archbishop of Manila, and concelebrated by Archbishop Niceto uh, and Archbishop Filoni, who was then the nuncio and the preacher. The homilist at my ordination was Cardinal Tagle, the then Bishop of Imus Cavite. And uh, oh, that, that was a most unforgettable experience for me. It was a lot tell of us Bishop, yeah, yeah. Get, tell us the story. Uh, take us to that, <laughs> to that time, um, how you felt, what you went through, uh, the, 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 the event itself. Um, ano po ang, uh, how did you feel? Yes, well, <laughs> it there were a lot of funny things that happened then, you know, because uh, when I was ordained uh, as a bishop, I don't know why they they appointed two as, uh, altar servers, the ones that, that were the closest to assist me, who were sort of challenged, height challenged. You know, I'm a very tall person. And <laughs> even when I was kneeling, I was a bit taller than they. Oh, you know? oh, no. <laughs> now, uh, they they did not reckon with the fact that part of the ordination rite was the imposition of the book of gospels above the head of the bishop. So that book of gospels is a huge, huge book like that, and metal covered and very heavy. And the two altar servers were to, supposed to be holding the book of gospels on both ends and then raise it open above the head of the uh, bishop who's being ordained. But they were trying to raise it, you know, they, they kept it above my head. It was supposed to be about four inches above my head. But I could see that their arms were trembling like that because it was so heavy. And uh, gradually, they, uh, it got lower and lower from four inches down to three, to two, to one, two. They really, you know, imposed it on my head. Which imposition. They were not, it's truly an imposition. <laughs> they were not supposed to do that. But the poor guys were really uh, worn out. Or, you know, they, uh, they strained. And so they just, you know, let the full weight of the Book of Gospels, you know, uh, uh, press on my head. And it was the first time that I felt that the, the gospel, you know, the word of God was literally very heavy, very <laughs> heavy, you know. It's like I was feeling dizzy after a while, you know. Uh, but, but that was it, you know. Uh, that, that's the funny part, you know. But something happened after that, you know. Uh, so after that, that, that book of gospels, uh, well, I, I don't know if it happened before. Yeah, this, of course, of course. It happened before, I think. Um, Archbishop Rosales, the cardinal, you know, had the whole pitcher of uh, oil uh, for the anointing of the bishop, you know. And normally, uh, the, uh, the main celebrant, the presider, uh, the ordaining prelate, would just pour a little bit of it, you know. But you know what he did? He poured the whole thing. He dumped it literally on my head. And it was dripping like that over my eyes, over my ears, you know, down to, uh, to my shoulders. You know, I was all really soaked in, in, in the anointing, the oil for the anointing. And, uh, and then after that, uh, my hair was supposed to be shampooed, you know, uh, to be prepared for the next part of the, of the ordination rite. There was no shampoo. They, they forgot, not even soap, you know. So, uh -huh. so they, they, they tried to pour a little bit of water on my head, but they couldn't get rid of the oil. And then yeah. they, 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 they shook it with a towel like that, but my, all my hair was gelled like that with the thick oil, you know, that couldn't be gotten rid of, you know. It really got stuck to me, you know. Uh -huh. But anyway, during the part of the imposition of the hands, uh, oh, this is the most strange part, you know, and I will never forget this. Uh, and I think it, might, it, might, it, it, it could be, I don't know what the medical or physical explanation for it. I don't know if it is uh, uh, related at all to the fact that my head was pressed by a very, very heavy book like that with metal covering it. 
But something strange happened. While the, uh, so the first bishop to, to impose his hand on me was Cardinal Rosales. And the moment he imposed his hand on my head like that, I heard an explosion. It's a boom, like that, you know? And that, I was jolted and I said, oh my God, what was that? I looked around. I thought there was an act of terrorism happening inside the cathedral. <clears throat> but I looked at the face of the cardinal and he, he was serene. Obviously, he didn't hear it. And then I looked at the faces of the other bishops. They didn't hear it either. Mm. I said, what was that? And then Archbishop Aniceto, same, boom, like that. And then the, the nuncio, boom, like that. And then I said to myself, oh my goodness, I think I'm going to pass out. Mm. You know? And then I said, is it because... It, does this, does this mean I'm feeling dizzy and, and I'm going to lose consciousness? I'm going to pass out? I said, and I prayed very hard. I said, oh God, please don't let me pass out. It's going to be very embarrassing. They will have to, they will have to interrupt this ordination if I pass out. And it's not going to be a valid ordination. You know? <laughs> I really prayed very hard, you know. I really thought I was you know, in the process of passing out. I don't know, you are the doctor. I don't know what the medical explanation for that, if it is connected to the amount of oil that was dumped on my head and the very heavy book that was, you know, put on top of me or the stress of preparation, uh, all that. But anyway, I was wondering because I was not even feeling dizzy. I wasn't dizzy. I was okay. I could follow everything. I was, you know, in my elements, except that I was hearing explosions. Mm. So that they just were three, not... Just three in a row, um, <laughs> Bishop. Uh, oh, no, all of them, all of them. All of them, when they laid their hands on you. So, take note, I had 65 bishops laying their hands on me. Oh, 65 then, times you've heard it. Uh, three times the strongest. You know, the strongest was Cardinal Rosales. The second was... Cardinal, uh, Archbishop, well, now he became Cardinal also Filoni, and then Archbishop Aniceto, you know. And uh, three times I heard the very strong explosion. And I was being jolted like that, you know. But they weren't even noticing that I was getting jolted. Wow. Uh, I think because they were, usually when, when bishops impose their hands, they close their eyes like mm. that. They're very prayerful, you know. And so you can imagine each of the 65 bishops after that. Uh -huh. And the, the, the explosion started to wane. Wow. So uh, halfway through, it was no longer boom, but boom, like that. Mm. And then the very last one was boom. That mm. was it. Mm. And that was the end of it. And I didn't pass out. Mm. I didn't pass out. Up to this day, I have wow. no explanation for what happened. Well, all, I can, all I can say was, the, the coming of the spirit was explosive. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it gives us chill. It gives me chills, uh, Bishop Ambo, to to yeah. hear that. You know, from the time that you were over anointed with the holy oil, <laughs> and then the 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 concussion that you received, the the the, <laughs> the gospel, and then those explosions. I mean, I know it's 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 funny, right? But it sounds. It, it, it for me, with no pun intended, it does sound like it, the Holy Spirit was there. Yeah, those are sacred explosions, I would call them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? Oh, oh. Wow, I, I'm sure the, the audience will agree. But go on, go on, go on. Sige, Bishop. Bishop. Yes. Continue, now, now I'll tell you about the titular diocese, you know, okay. because some uh -huh. people ask me about it. Uh, in fact, I was the first one to ask about it, you know. Uh, I spoke to Aposeto, the Archbishop of uh, San Fernando. I said, Archbishop, I was appointed titular bishop of a diocese in Italy. Where is that? And what is my role? What is my responsibility for that diocese? And he laughed. And, and, and Archbishop Aniceto said, I was also a titular bishop before I became a bishop of my own diocese. And I never saw it. He said, um, you know, titular diocese, they're just a title. Forget about it, he said. It's just a title. Uh, usually they are dioceses that existed once upon a time in a certain place, you know, and sometimes they're not even existing anymore, you know. And so I forgot about it. But a few months later, believe it or not, 
I received a letter in three languages. So the letter was written in French, in Spanish, and Italian. But because I know French, I immediately knew that the French was broken French, you mm -hmm. know. And I know Spanish also, and the Spanish was broken Spanish. Uh, but the Italian was perfect. Wow. So I said, it was written by an Italian. And it was very funny the way it was written, you know. <laughs> and he says, uh, your excellency, you know, uh, we are your loyal subjects. <laughs> loyal, <laughs> <people> <laughs> subjects. Loyal, your loyal subjects in your diocese, in your titular diocese of Guardial Fiera. I said, what's going on? Who are these people? I said, and they even followed up by email. In short, uh, the letter was inviting me to visit my titular diocese in Guadiara Fiera in Italy in order to reconsecrate the cathedral that, that apparently was demolished by an earthquake and it had to be rebuilt. And, um, and according to canon law, uh, once rebuilt, it had to be reconsecrated, you know. Um, and, but normally, uh, well, well, so I did not yet know that, that, that this titular diocese had been reduced to a parish. Um, so it was now part of a uh, parish, now part of a larger diocese called Termoli Larino. But they insisted anyway. But I had to verify if it was, if, if, if it was for real because I thought really it was hoax. Mm -hmm. I thought somebody was pulling my leg, you know. <laughs> so I had to verify, do my research in the internet and found out that indeed there was this titular diocese of Guadiel Fiera. That this titular diocese was now uh, canonically a parish, part of a larger diocese, uh, and the, the bishop then was Gianfranco de Luca. And uh, that this uh, titular diocese is situated in the region of uh, Molise in Campobasso, uh, next to a beautiful lake, the lake of Guadiel Fiera. And uh, it so happened that, you know, uh, we had to be sent to Rome for the Conference for Baby Bishops. <laughs> you know, we called it the Conference for Baby Bishops. When you're ordained a bishop, you have to undergo some kind of uh, a training, you know, for uh, neophyte bishops. So during the time that uh, we stayed at the Collegio Filipino, and take note, I was ordained in the same batch as uh, Bishop Bobet Maliari. Oh. Yes, uh, he was ordained in March, I was ordained in July. Uh, and we were both assigned as auxiliary bishops of the Archdiocese of San Fernando. So we underwent the same conference for the baby bishops. And uh, it was then that I invited him to come along. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I communicated by email to the ones who invited me if I could bring along a brother bishop from Pampanga. And uh, yes, sure enough, uh, uh, Bishop Bobet said yes. And uh, we were picked up by, uh, you know, he, he was a very lovable Italian, an old Italian, uh, by the name of uh, Vincenzo di Sabato. Uh, Vincenzo, you know, he was vertically challenged, uh, almost like a hobbit. You know, oh, in, no. <laughs> in the Lord of the Rings, you know, when he opened the door uh, of the Colegio Filipino, uh, and I recognized that he must be the guy who was going to pick me up. So I waved at him like that to say, this is me, you know, and he had seen my picture in the internet. So, you know, he opened his arms like that and he said, oh, il mio vescovo, you know, my bishop, you know. And then he ran to me and embraced me like that. And his head was only up to my stomach. <laughs> and embraced me like a long lost friend. And it was my first time to meet him, you know. Uh -huh. And then he brought me and Bishop Bobet by car. And they were very provincial, you know. It's like there are provinciano Italians who, have, who don't go to the cities. Right. And they, they had such a difficulty navigating their way to Rome because they're not used to it, you know. So they got lost and all this. They had to ask around how to get to Collegio Filipino. So finally, we found our way to Guadiana Fiera. Oh my goodness, what a quaint little town, you know. 
it's like time stood still. It's like a small Italian village perched on a hilltop like that, overlooking a beautiful lake, and you would have to circle around the hill in order to reach the top, and that top is the city of Guardia Fiera, with just around 2,000 residents, you know, and that's the whole, that's the whole thing. And it was walled like that, a bit like Assisi, if you have been to Assisi, in Aindipa, uh, uh, oh, you, that's one place you should visit, you know. Uh, it's, uh, and so that's, uh, when we got there, uh, the whole main street was blocked like that, uh, and there were banderitas, banners, and then a big welcome sign saying, welcome to our new titular bishop of Guadi Alfiera. And the two of us were garbed like bishops, uh, uh, Bishop Bobet and myself, you know. And the people were lined up in the streets uh, on both sides like that, waving their banners, welcoming us, old people, young people, you know. Uh, and old people would come and kiss us like that, or really smack like that oh, on their yeah. face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they prepared a huge banquet in the street, you know, uh, and they welcomed me in the cathedral. And, uh, and then I met the bishop, there was the bishop there, you know, and I, I had to elbow him like that and says, Bishop, I'm, I'm very embarrassed that they, they are taking this title very seriously. <laughs> and I know that it's just a titular thing, you know, but you are the real bishop of this diocese, you know. And, and he whispered to me and he said, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, they are really taking it very seriously. It's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, I know you're going back to the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to stay here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he did not feel threatened about it. You know, when, when I entered the cathedral, there was a, even a huge banner of my coat of arms above the, the, the cathedral scene, you know, which is supposed to be his, but actually uh, the, the, the bishop said, no, 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 you are the titular bishops. That is why they put your coat of arms, you know. Uh, you're uh, above the, the cathedral sea because that is your sea, he said. Wow. Titular, you know. Yeah. And oh, it was an unforgettable experience, really. What a lovely people. Oh, Did yeah. You know? And twice I visited it. And the second time I was with my brother, Randy David, and my mm -hmm. sister-in-law, Karina. Uh, and then they were also, they, they, they were joking with me, you know, it's just... Uh, uh, your fiefdom, they called it my fiefdom. <laughs> <laughs> <And> your subjects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, very nice people, and uh, the, uh, especially the parish priest there. Uh, the moment he was ordained, he was assigned to Guardia Alfiera, and he had known no other parish than Guardia Alfiera. Mm. And, and the last time that I went there, he, it was already his golden jubilee. Can you imagine 50 years as parish priest? Wow. wow. Yes, as parish priest, 50 years of only one parish. Wow. And so he knows every single soul in the place. You, you know, we were eating gelato in the middle of the street, uh, ice cream in the middle of the street. And he was waving like that. And he would call, Francesco, Guillermo, you didn't go to church today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and some of them were telling us, you know, uh, when our parish priest dies, uh, we will mourn him more than we will mourn our own parents. Mm -hmm. Because they said they, were, they had all become very close to the parish priest. Mm -hmm. It is this parish priest who had baptized them, mm -hmm. married them in church, you know, uh, catechized them and taken care of their elderly people. In, he put up a home for the elderly people you know, there. Wow. Well, Bishop. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so you've taken us to this beautiful, remarkable story of your priesthood up until you became auxiliary bishop, and then when in when was this? When all of a sudden we received is it five years ago now that you would be the bishop of the diocese of Caloocan. I would like to say this because po you know, kapampangan ko. And then when I realized that we're going to lose Apungambo in San Fernando, I, I honestly, frankly speaking, I was selfish. I'm like, no, you know, he's, we can't afford to lose Apungambo. And so, but of course, he'll be bishop. And then I looked at the map. 
I said, I'm not really good in Manila, the map geography. And I looked at how far San Fernando Pampang would be at Caloocan. And I was like, okay, he's going to be okay. But yeah, yeah, but I just wanted to say when, before you moved there, I have to say this to the public, Bishop Pombo, I cannot believe it. Even when he was busy, he was about to go and get all of these events ready for him. Everyone is waiting for him in the Diocese of Colocan. Is, is that the installation you call it, Paul? Bishop Ambo, you, they, you'll, he'll be installed. And yet he still wrote a letter to commend, to write a letter for commendation for my mother who was being, uh, who was being nominated, nominated yes. as the most outstanding Kapampangan in the religious service, my mom, Adela Sapanta. In fact, she won. And the thing is, it's a category of which no one that was non-religious ever won except my mom. Mm-hmm. She's not religious, of course. She's a lay like me. And she had me, so she's not a religious sister. She's not a priest, but she was the only first candidate who ever got the nomination and then won as the most outstanding kapampangan in the religious service category. And Bishop Ambo, I didn't even know that he was about to be installed mm-hmm. as Diocese of Colocan. Of course, he kept it and up until that time, the news erupted in the internet. But again, I just want to say thank you, Bishop. And I just want people to know because the, you are now very a public persona in Facebook and social media. They see your homilies. They know where you are now. But the behind the scenes are much more heartwarming, heartfelt. They are more of the pastoral Mm-hmm. I would have to say. So on behalf of my mom and my family, I'll never forget that. But take us to when you became a bishop in Diocese of Colocan, because talking about pastoral, I think, I think now seeing that, even though you're auxiliary bishop in San Fernando, Pampanga, even though ako po, buriko po, na you would meant be staying there in our province, as if the first time all of our eyes were open, like this is Bishop Ambo, as pastoral as he can be, as spiritual father as he can be, because I think the Holy Spirit took you there mm-hmm. and said, we need Ambo here, right there and right now. I'm having goosebumps because I don't think ever that there could have been a, a, another bishop that was just appropriate and, mm-hmm. and, and um, at the right place at the right time. So take us there, Bishop. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that was in uh, January of 2016, you know, that the Pope Francis appointed me as the second bishop of the Diocese of Caloocan, young, young diocese, you know, because the Archdiocese of Manila had to be split up to several little dioceses. And one of them was the Diocese of Caloocan, uh, which included the cities of Caloocan, Malabon, and Navotas. Huge diocese of more than 2 million uh, people, you know, faithful. Um, you know, I have friends from India uh, who are also bishops and who tell me that they have a diocese of about 100,000 people. <laughs> and when I tell them that my diocese has about 2 million faithful, you know, they say, oh my God, how do you do that? You know, but it is like that in the Philippines, you know. So, um, yes, uh, I, I do not know. Maybe God had the reason for sending me to the diocese of Caloocan uh, because um, it was right when I was installed as a bishop, uh, a few months later, that a new government took over and started talking about a campaign against illegal drugs, which we welcomed, by the way, mm-hmm. because we admitted that, that, the, uh, that illegal drugs were really a big problem. You know, sometimes people misunderstand me about that, you know. Of course we want, of course we want to eradicate this huge problem, you know. But my concept of getting rid of this problem is, uh, you know, since we were young people, they always said, save the users, jail the pusher, you know, something like that, you know. But nothing ever said kill the pusher, you know, or kill the users, you know. It was, you know, uh, impose the law on them, you know, because there has to be uh, 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 law, you know, it has to be done lawfully. And uh, it was when uh, people started visiting me, uh, the families of victims, the widows and the orphans who would cry and, and, and give their testimony and neighbors, you know, talking about how many of them had been just summarily executed. That really broke me. You, you cannot remain, yeah, for what, whatever, whatever uh, violations they committed in law, you know, um, 
it's not enough to say they deserve to die. Yeah, we don't have death penalty in the Philippines, you know. Um, so he said, of course, you, you impose the full force of the law on people who have violated the law, you know. But please, for heaven's sake, I cannot rehabilitate dead people, you know. We put up a, a community-based drug rehabilitation program, you know, to save them because most of these come from the slum communities who live a very, very stressful life. And I would understand why many of them would fall victims to substance abuse, you know. They're coping with a depressing kind of uh, condition, you know. Many of them are jobless. Many of them are handling, you know, very... Uh, menial jobs that pay very little, you know, and they live in subhuman conditions. Uh, so you would understand why many of them would try to escape reality by resorting to negative coping mechanisms like, uh, like drugs, you know. So I said, you know, these, these are not bad people, you know. Um, they, are, they are victims. They're sick people. I've always looked at addiction as a disease, as a sickness, you know. And it's not like it cannot be cured. We can handle it professionally, you know. I had to partner with psychologists, psychotherapists, you know, psychiatrists to be able to put up our own uh, community-based drug rehab program to save lives. Mm -hmm. and, and I called our drug rehab program something like a Schindler's List. Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch the yeah. Schindler's yeah. List? Yeah, yeah. To save just a few lives, you know, even just one life, you know, that, that's well worth it. But uh, yes, the, uh, that was the context in which I changed my strategies in pastoral leadership. Instead of just building parishes, I started building mission stations mm -hmm. among the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and these were mostly the slum communities where the presence of the church was very minimal. So I uh, partnered with religious congregations and missionary congregations so that I could send, you know, uh, priests, sisters, and lay missionaries to the outskirts, to, to all the slum communities that, uh, you know, were not being attended to. Well, it's been uh, an exciting experience, you know. Um, yes. Uh, wow. But I, I don't... Like... We, we have to move on, you know, because you know, uh, the, the second part of this discussion is supposed to be you, you know. Yeah, no, 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 okay. no. Are, Bishop, are, do you have just just an idea? More than one hour? Is that okay? A little? Or That's are okay you, with me okay. because uh, okay. I, I don't have my noontime mass anymore. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, that just gives us a perspective. Okay, yeah. all right. That's Bishop, you, you are the embodiment of, um, uh, of the sacrament of service and what you do. Um, and because bishops, uh, priests, and deacons, they are called to not just preach and teach the good news of Christ and to celebrate the sacraments um, and, and build the community, but isn't it, Paul, it's also serving the poor and all those in need. Yes, uh, would you mind talking a little bit more about priesthood, the calling, mm -hmm. uh, uh, episcopal, yeah. uh, the, the, yeah. the presbytery? You know, um, the priesthood, first of all, is something we all share. I'd like to begin that way, you know. Because uh, uh, I don't know if you have read about the, the common priesthood of the faithful. We are all members of the faithful, the community of the baptized, and we are all participants in the life and mission of the body of Christ, which is the church. So the only priest, the only, the one unique priest that we consider as truly priestly is Jesus Christ. Uh, Apart from Christ, nobody can be priestly at all, whether in the common priesthood or in the sacramental priesthood. That is why even your, part, your participation in marriage, you know, is also very priestly in that sense. So what is that priesthood? Well, Jesus Christ has revolutionized the meaning of the priesthood because the priesthood is mediation of a covenant uh, and offering of a sacrifice to mediate the covenant between God and humankind. But the, the, the most revolutionary thing about the priesthood of Christ is in his sacrifice, the priest and the victim, the offerer and the offering become one. Because in ancient times, the concept of priesthood is the priest would offer a sacrifice for a sinner. And he would say, 
I will offer a lamb for you. So he would slaughter an animal, you know, uh, on behalf of the sinner. It's not the sinner who is hurt, and it is not the offerer who is hurt either. It is the lamb. But in the revolutionary kind of uh, priesthood of Jesus Christ, he will not say, I will offer a lamb for you. He will say, I will be the lamb. I'll give my life for you. And so to be truly priestly is to give one's life. Uh, to say, my life no longer belongs to me. It belongs to Christ who lives in me. And that is what it means to be a Christian. It is to live in kenosis, in a total emptying of self, so that it is Christ who lives in us, and we now participate in the life and mission of the Supreme High Priest, Jesus Christ. Now, there are two forms of participation in that priesthood. It, uh, the, on the one hand, the common participation, like all of us, including you. You are being priestly when you live out the marriage uh, in a very authentic way. Now, my participation is through the ordination, holy orders. Yours is the, uh, the, the sacrament of marriage, and they complement each other. The foundation of both holy orders and the sacrament of marriage is baptism, mm -hmm. the common baptism. And it is through that common baptism that we share in the priesthood of Christ. Now, my sharing in the priesthood of Christ has a specific, a specific definition in the sense that it is through the ministry of leadership in the community of Christ, through the presbyteral ministry. Uh, the holy orders come in three, uh, three forms, you know. Uh, the, these holy orders come in three forms, the episcopos, the bishop, the presbyteros, the priests or presbyters, and the deacons. Mm -hmm. So bishops, presbyters, and deacons. The bishop is an episcopos, meaning he oversees the community. He, he works with his presbyters and his deacons in a team, a collegium, in order to serve the function of leadership in the community of Christ so that the whole community becomes priestly, mm -hmm. so that the whole community is actively participating in the mission, in the life and mission of Jesus Christ. Our calling is not to monopolize the priesthood. It is rather to share that priesthood, mm -hmm. to build the whole community in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ who has no other offering than his whole life for the redemption of the world. That's it, you know. And so when I exercise my ordained priesthood, that means I share in the headship. Mm. Yeah, because you cannot have a body without a head, you know. To be able to share in the headship, meaning to make sure that no one leads the church but Christ. Mm -hmm. So we're not the leaders. Mm -hmm. We're not the shepherds. We're not the priests. It is Christ. So we only participate in that leadership of Christ in the Christian community. So that when we speak, it is Christ who is heard. When we lead, it is Christ who is leading his community. When we touch, it is Christ who touches the people through us as sacraments, as signs and instruments of the one priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. So ours is a ministry of leadership. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit has bestowed on the Christian community a multitude of gifts. And uh, the ordained priesthood, um, the ordained ministry is one form uh, because the charism or the gift of the Spirit is translated into a ministry. And that ministry is your concrete participation in the mission of the church. Now, you, you receive that through the gift of the sacrament of marriage. And then through the gift of the sacrament of marriage, you exercise a ministry also in your family and in the Christian community, in the church, that is unique to you as lay people. Because the lay people are called to live in the world, immersed in the world, as salt of the earth and light of the world. You are witnesses to the kingdom of God. So... We, you are participating in your own unique way as I am participating in my way as uh, uh, ordained to a specific ministry. Now when we talk about ministry, we talk about ministry in the plural, ministries. 
That is why it is important for every Christian to ask that question, what is my ministry? Because you receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will, will activate in you his gifts. And we have received many different kinds of gifts. Now, those gifts of the Spirit are not personal gifts of the Spirit to us. They are gifts of the Spirit to the church. They are gifts of the Spirit through the church to the world. You are supposed to be a gift of the Spirit to the world and a gift of the Spirit to the church. So if you are endowed with uh, a charism, you know, if you are good at something, uh, you are called to use that for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. That's when it becomes a ministry. That, that's why we, you know, I'm very happy that we are having this conversation and this conversation is being followed by a lot of people mm -hmm. who are also interested to know how they can participate in the life and mission of the church. Because before, you know, when we talk about mission, we only spoke about missionaries, you know, members of missionary congregations. Oh my goodness, that is wrong. Mission is about the whole church. You don't have a church if you don't have people participating in that mission. And that mission is the mission of Christ who lives in his body, the church. To participate in, uh, in mission you have to grow first in discipleship. You have to follow, you know, because participation in mission is already being sent. You are sent. Uh, mission is about apostleship. It's participating in the mission of Christ for which you are sent. What is the mission of Christ? It's a redemptive mission. Yeah, We have to participate in the redemptive mission of Christ to the world. And that, uh, uh, we're talking about salvation. Yeah. And take note, it's not only personal salvation. It's mm -hmm. the salvation mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. We always work not for ourselves, mm -hmm. not only for our personal salvation, but for the salvation of, of the world. And, and what would that uh, work for salvation entail? It will entail participation in the passion, death, and resurrection mm -hmm. of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to die right. in order to die to ourselves so that Christ will carry on with his work of redemption. What's the difference between redemption and salvation? Well, you know, the concept of salvation is very limiting. You know, the concept of salvation is, you know, God saves the good and punishes the wicked. But redemption is God saves not just the good, but sinners too. Mm -hmm. You see, it's a revolutionary concept of salvation. It is still salvation, but when you start talking of the salvation even of those who don't deserve it, of the salvation even of, the, uh, of those who uh, uh, are undeserving, the, the sinful, you know, then you're talking about redemption. Wow. You cannot, you cannot work for the salvation of sinners and the undeserving without participating in the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. Wow. You know, Bishop, that was a lot to digest and to ponder. And I hope that the audience, rewind po natin because then- There's so much there. Yeah. It's only then that we can actually internalize what Bishop Mamboha just said. And I would like to ask a question based on that remarkable statement that you've mentioned that we are the body of Christ and each of us it belongs to a certain degree of ministry. What do you do here? And so, you know, kung Pilipino po, uh, anong ginagawa ko dito sa bahay namin, sa pamilya namin, sa office ko, sa eskwelahan, anong ginagawa ko? The thing is, in the political and socioeconomic background of the Philippines and all over the world, what you had just given, Bishop, Unfortunately, instead of being the body of Christ, we are we have been broken in such a way that instead of instead of self-sacrificing, we put down people, you know, forgetting that in order to be disciples and to do that kenosis, to do self-emptying, no, we want to fill up. No, ako muna. Ako muna. If I don't like you, then 
I don't want you, you're gone. And so let's talk about salvation versus redemption. How does that fit in all of what Bishop Ambo had just said? Paano mo sasabihin na you are part of the body of Christ when someone who had just sinned, you're already condemning. So uh, all of this, what Bishop Ambo had just said, and so to internalize and break them down, ano ang ginagawa natin na Pilipino kapag ka isang tao na hindi natin siya gusto, mahina siya, or uh, marami siyang kasalanan. And then instead of lifting up, instead of saying, what can I do so that I can become really the body of Christ? Because we can't go to Mass and say, the body of Christ, amen. And then all of a sudden, we just realize, my God, we are hypocrites then. So my question there, Bishop, is uh, in what is happening in this world, especially in, Philippine, in the Philippines, and unfortunately, we have become people that we just love to read sound bites. If it is a long article, how do we even begin to learn what you had just said, how to become like Christ, like disciples, if sound bites lang, tapos mabilis ka pang maniwala kasi it's fake news. So can you please, uh, you know, guide us with that, Bishop? Yes. Uh, well, um, the gift of the Spirit. Uh, our teacher is really the Holy Spirit, you know. Um, to, to make sure that we keep our lives open to the promptings and the movements of the Holy Spirit. One of the signs that the Spirit is not at work in us is, is division, you know, factionalism, when we spite each other and hate each other. If we really receive the same Holy Spirit, you know, in Filipino they say, ang sakit ng kalingkingan, ramdam ng buong katawan. Uh, in, in English, the best translation for that is the pain of one part is the pain of the whole body. Uh, Dr. Jude is a, I love is a it. doctor. I love it, yeah. Dr. Jude is, uh, is a doctor, and Dr. Jude would know that pain is not always negative. Pain is a good indicator. When there is pain, it means something is wrong. And then uh, when they try to diagnose it, they try to interpret where the pain is coming from and what is causing it. I hate to say this, but sometimes the body of Christ is sick. Mm. You will not feel the pain of the other members if there is a certain numbness. You know, sometimes the body can be afflicted by cancerous cells. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there are also cancerous cells in the body of Christ. You know, sometimes the body can suffer something like a stroke, such that uh, you don't feel the other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. It's like a paralyzed body. I think in many places around the world, the church is like paralyzed. The church is uh, in a state of illness, you know. And, and so uh, we have to do all we can to work for unity so that we will move in a coordinated way. But that cannot happen if we're very judgmental of each other. We have to keep our minds open to continue to listen to each other, to feel each other where each one is really coming from. And then we aspire always for unity. And, and the point of unity would always be faith, hope, and love. Because no matter what gifts you received from the Holy Spirit, all of those gifts are still minor gifts. The major gifts, the greater gifts are always faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these gifts is love. And that love is not your love, but the love of Christ. Because we are called to love one another as Christ has loved us. We have to learn to love with the love of Christ. You know, that's why my interpretation of the sacrament of marriage is uh, it is not a bond only between husband and wife, between a man and a woman. No, no, no. Your, your sacrament, it becomes truly a sacrament because it is a bond between you together and Jesus Christ. The bond is Christ. The one who keeps you bonded with God is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bond. Because Christ now is our covenant. Remember, he united divinity and humanity in himself. He is our covenant. Uh, because of Jesus Christ, God and humankind have become inseparable. Because you cannot never separate anymore the divinity from the humanity of Christ. He is truly human and truly divine. And so he is our greatest bridge he, the work of Christ, the redemptive work of Christ is to bridge us. That is why, uh, you know, the Pope is called the Pontifex Maximus. Did you know that title? The Supreme 
bridge builder. Mm-hmm. The supreme bridge builder. We're called to build bridges, not walls. Not walls. You know, and, and when we become, you know, too narrow-minded, then, then we will tend to build more walls, you know. Uh, J- Christ came to demolish the walls, you know, between Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, men and women, you know, so that we could become one body in Jesus Christ. Wow. I hope I'm making sense in what you I'm are. Oh my goodness. You know, Bishop, I, I have this uh, kind of enlightenment. There was some symbolism when that, um, when that heavy <laughs> book of Gospels was laid on your head. <laughs> <laughs> because Bishop, you you are truly not just an academician, but uh-huh. you are. Um, um, you you so eloquently put it, uh, redemption versus salvation, mm-hmm. uh, the 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 gospel of mercy, which you have written about. The gospel of All mercy. Of those here, see, are, we have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 um, I, I actually I, I was just while you were talking, I was thinking. I, I, I'll take a stab at this, Bishop Mumbo. Isn't Guadalfiera? Guardian yeah. of the fire, doesn't it mean mm. guardian of the fire? So the, uh, you being over anointed with holy oil, I'm doing air quotes, mm-hmm. and then the book of the Gospels, you hearing those loud sounds, and and we all can probably agree if we are faithful, this is probably the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. and then you having a titular um, um, a, a place called uh, be, uh, being the guardian of the fire, isn't that? Isn't that very, doesn't that come together? Yes. Right? As, as uh, you are bishop, truly, not just a leader, but you're being called to a vocation, not just of service, but of taking care of the gospel and teaching the truth. Exactly. And, and um, this is awesome for, the, for, the, for all of us who are just learning. We are students and every day we're learning and you've, you've brought forth so much into this conversation that I would really suggest for those of you who are listening and tuning in late, we're talking about marriage and yes. holy orders, okay. uh, the sacraments of service. Um, anyway. So Bishop, are we, you okay, right? Bishop, for over time, that yes. way we can cover a little bit of the uh, sacrament of- Marriage. marriage. Uh, yes. And then maybe- I want to hear from you because uh, you're the one celebrating your 22nd <laughs> you know, you. anniversary in the sacrament of matrimony. And uh, you're doing your own witnessing, you know, as a couple, as a family, as participants in the life and mission of Christ in your in the ministry that you are now engaged in, this is one beautiful expression of your ministry. By the way, Empower yeah. Philippines and Coffee Conversations. You, yes. wow, yeah. you know the the your contribution in the formation of many people in the world is uh, very precious. But to and God be the glory, uh, Bishop. Yeah. I, we know that you are very instrumental in inspiring mm-hmm. us. You were the one who told mm-hmm. us, you know, go ahead and do this. Um, it's not easy, but and I think this is where we are called to sanctification. When it's not easy, when we are tried, when we are exhausted, when we do all these things in the background. Uh, if there's anything good about it, we must have read since, since May. <laughs> we must have read like maybe 40 books <laughs> by different authors. And you know, Palanon, Bishop, how do you do it? Like all of these books, you know? Yeah. Bishop, when I see you, I want you to put down a heavy weight or something. Maybe it will work on us. Because you can see the commercial. I saw it on Facebook. I saw it on the bat. You know, anyway. You know, Jude and Therese, uh, I'm really amazed because... Uh, what you're doing is not simple. You know? Like when you engage the Scott Hahn with, uh, with, uh, in, a, in a conversation, you know, this man who is uh, such a heavyweight also, um, you had to read his thoughts. You, know? you had to take seriously his publications and to be able to, to pose sensible questions. You cannot have a sensible conversation if you are not really aware of where the other is coming from, you know, and what his background is and what, what he has been teaching, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I take my hats off to, to oh, all. What a great compliment coming from you, Bishop. But um, I want to share with the, with the audience that as we do that, we're learning. We, started, we're, we discovered the beauty of our faith. Um, you don't discover something beautiful mm-hmm. without touching it, without smelling mm-hmm. it, without really dissecting it, mm-hmm. just like a flower. Mm-hmm. And, and as we learn, for the listeners, as we, we, we're still learning, we don't know so much. As we learn, we realize there's, we don't know anything, right? And then we realize the beauty, just like in marriage. And so this is a great uh, a segue to marriage. The beauty of marriage is when you dissect all the trials and tribulations and you start to overcome it. 
the sacrament is tested, the covenant oath is tested during, during the most difficult of times, during the trials. It's not during the happy times, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I like to call it, if there is a sacrifice of the mass, I like to call it the sacrifice of marriage. Because if you don't sacrifice, you will lose it. And uh, I think there is a quote that I have in the bathroom. If you don't work for your sacrifice, I mean, if you, if, what was that? If you, if you, uh, if you don't work hard for your sacrifice, price, you're giving it. Your you're sacrifice, giving. you lose it anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's a sacrifice of marriage because there was a certain point, Bishop, I would have to admit, well, uh, the beauty of marriage is it was from the, from the, the bad, until it becomes good and until until it purifies you like a purgatory and then you become holier than when you were when we got married <clears throat> 22 years ago when i married jude august october 18 1998 at san agustin in intramuros <laughs> I had like 350 guests because kapampangan po is like a Greek wedding. And Jude said, my God, how am I going to pay for 350 guests? And I don't even know 350. I only know maybe 12 people and the rest of her. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. I had I had 20 guests or something like that. <laughs> so, you know, you know, you, you do, sorry, I wouldn't say stupid things, but you do immature things. And then later on into you venture into your marriage, you start to say, why did I marry this man? And why did he marry me? Because there are times we don't even see eye to eye. But then the good thing about it, Bishop, is that first I always tell Skylar and Zach, I think our parents are mothers who are prayerful because without them, the domestic family, you know, the domestic church in within the family, if they didn't pray for us, I don't know if Jude and I will even meet. Uh, and, and so we do the same thing for our own children. And then at the same time, this sacrifice of marriage, Bishop, we see it revealed to us as more beautiful the more pain and sacrifice uh, we experience and how when we commit to being the body of christ with you like bishop with the priest my mom is always that person after the mass hindi po siya umaalis ng simbahan na hindi nagmamano sa pare and <clears throat> says hello po my, my name is del uh I would like to meet you. She says, you can't go there and then in and out and then think that you know your faith. It won't work that way. You have to work hard for it. And so my mom was known by many. And, and I know that Bishop called her the most cordial in Pampanga because she is that. And I wish I could be a ha a, an inch of her, even just an inch of her. And I like to to say, Bishop, thank you that because of you, because of your ministry in holy orders, it makes our marriage also stronger. Because I don't think I can do this with just he and I. We do it with God, center as the center of our marriage, and then with priests like you who hand in hand, I don't think we can do it together. And you don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think you can do it together too. So salamat po, because this sacrifice of marriage, this, this uh, uh, sacrament becomes as sacred as it can be with you, mm -hmm. with, with people, with all of us who are into this. So, sorry, You know, you know, um, I am. I'm really struck that uh, we both received our uh, our sacraments. My uh, sacrament of uh, uh, holy orders in the episcopacy and your sacrament of matrimony in the same place, intramuros. Oh, man. imagine that. Yes. And uh, you know, I. Uh, I didn't even know that uh, your marriage was at, uh, in Intramuros. Uh, San Agustin Church is a stone's throw away from the cathedral where I was ordained a bishop, you know. Wow, wow. Well, that, that's nice, you know. It's like things are really falling into place. Yeah. Oh, wow. but, uh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, bishop. Yeah, and, I, and I was also going to say that your parents were quite an inspiration in, 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 in San Fernando, Pampanga. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Sapanta and Mondel, you know, uh, oh, they, they were really leading figures in the Christian community. Like I said, uh, your mom was like Miss Congeniality, you know, she knew everyone. But uh, what made her really special is uh, she knew not only the, the rich and the famous, above all, 
she knew the names mm-hmm. of the, 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 the people who were ignored around the community. Yeah. It's, it was really amazing that she would call by name even the beggars, even the, the Sampagita peddlers, even the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the people who were selling wares you know, in the marketplace. Um, very personal approach. You know, she, she had a way of evangelizing. You know? And I think you, you, I, I could say you picked up a lot from, from your both parents, you know, and your father was a Eucharistic minister, you know, yes. very dedicated to the Eucharist. You know? It's like we all grow in our vocation families, you know, mm-hmm. and Dr. Jude also belongs to that kind of family also, you know. Uh, uh, we're both parents, physicians, uh, Dr. Jude. Um, uh, my mother, Paul. My mother was a physician, right. yes, yes, yes. That's yes. right, yes. It's amazing, you know, how, how we, we pick up our vocation right from our families. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. like, uh, uh, that's why I, I always connect somehow the sacrament of orders with the sacrament of matrimony. Because right. the seedbed for the vocation to the uh, ordained ministry is the, the sacrament of marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, you were called to be one body. Uh, that, that is what we call the sacrament of matrimony. You know, you are two, but you're called to a certain kind of unity, a unity that is that multiplies itself in your children until you become family. You know, and you build a kind of a domestic church. It's like uh, by being bonded together, not only by blood, not only by your marital love for each other, but bonded together in the same spirit that keeps the church bonded together. You are a microcosm of the church. That's why we call the family the domestic church. Mm-hmm. And I think I grew in that domestic church myself. Mm-hmm. Well, we prayed the rosary. Uh, you know, my mother led the, the rosary together, you know, every night. And, and during the time that Father Patrick Payton popularized the, the, the praying of the rosary, the uh, rosary crusade, you know, uh, the family that prays together stays together. And, you know, I, I've told you that I belong to a huge family of 13 children, seven boys, six girls, you know. And for the life of me, I don't know how our parents brought us up decently uh, to uh, uh, be educated. And, uh, you know, that not one of us is a liability to society. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's amazing, you know. I can only attribute that to the depth of faith. Uh, so they also participated in the body of Christ, you know, uh, and contributed their own ministry like you now are participating. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we'll ask 10 more minutes of you, uh, Bishop, uh, and then maybe we can entertain one question or two. Um, but for the listeners who are out there, uh, if they are, of course, we, we advocate paying for your kids while they're young to find the right spouses and their uh, um, partners in life. Um, uh, is there something that they can do to prepare? In the United States, there's the, the pre-Cana sessions that are required for marriage. And um, it's usually six months prior to, it kind of prepares you because the sacrament of marriage is a calling. It's, mm-hmm. it's not an emotional uh, uh, response. It's a, it's a calling. It has to be deliberately thought of. Um, that way, when you get into this, you're being prepared uh, uh, for, for that covenant oath. Meron Puba, is there such a thing in the Philippines as pre cana sessions that people can attend to? It's a universal requirement, Jun. No Anywhere in the world, uh, you don't just, uh, you know, bless a marriage, you don't just uh, uh, lead them to the sacrament without preparation. And I think that's where we are very much wanting. Yes, we do have pre cana sessions, but I think they're still very inadequate, you know. Um, I think not only when uh, they are already applying to, to be married, uh, should we provide a formation opportunity. I think the church should provide the opportunity for formation already from courtship, you know, right. that, uh, that they are being accompanied. And, and I don't know, I, I've always dreamed of promoting mentorship, you know, that, uh, that married people mentor younger people who are looking at the uh, marital vocation as their vocation in life, you know. The, there are many married people who are listening to us, you know. And I, I wish, uh, you know, couples who, who have matured in their relationship, 
uh, you know, would mentor younger couples. That's very important. Mm -hmm. um, aside from pre cana they should be post cana as well. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. Beautiful. That, that yeah. When when they're married already, yeah. there is still a follow up, a constant follow up by the mentors, you know. And uh, I promote that kind of a relationship between the mentors and the mentees, you know, uh, to to make sure that every step of the way, because the you will always be for, uh, facing many different hurdles, mm -hmm. and you are more familiar with them than I am, yes. you know. I am familiar with married people like my parents, like my brothers and sisters. I am familiar with the crisis that uh, the, the different hurdles, you know, that they had to go through the different crisis. And um, I think you are in the best position, you know, to speak about uh, how you rise above uh, the self, you know, uh, because uh, that is always the difficulty. There's a lot of kenosis that we all have to learn. Uh, just as I am learning kenosis in the context of the priestly ministry, I am sure you are learning a lot of kenosis also, you know, because uh, the, the ego is very assertive, <clears throat> you know, and, and people can get very vicious when their ego is hurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and that it's causing, uh, you know, a lot of conflicts among people. Uh, remember, the basic principle <clears throat> is... You entered marriage because God brought you together, not because you brought each other together. So I, don't, I never think of marriage as just your commitment to each other, even if that is very fundamental in marriage. No, no. It's Christ's commitment to you and your commitment to Christ. Because faith is our response to the call of Jesus Christ, you know. And the moment you respond to that call, you entered into that commitment, that covenant. So uh, when, you know, the foundation of marriage is to say what God has joined together that, that no one put asunder. Remember that? Yes. It is the principle of indissolubility of marriage. What, what is indissoluble there? The bond, the covenant bond. Mm -hmm. Not you. People can dissolve their relationship, you know. Mm -hmm. If you think of a marriage only as a contract, it is dissolvable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is why we have divorce, you know, uh, because people fall in love and fall out of love, you know, and they say if they only think of their marriage as their mutual love for each other, then it can really be dissolved. Uh, you know, if you, if you think of your marriage only as a contract and the contract will have provisions, you know, and if you violate those provisions, I'm out of here, you know, then it, then it is really dissoluble. But if the foundation of your marriage is the love of Christ. How can you dissolve the love of Christ? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what God has joined together, you cannot put asunder. You cannot dissolve because it's not you who put it together. It is God. You only responded to the invitation. On the other hand, what God has not put together, don't put together. That's the problem, you know? So when it is not the love of Christ that binds you, it, mm. you will really get dissolved. You will really get dissolved. Mm. Because in some instances, people receive a ritual sacrament, but not the real sacrament. Right, right. People can go through the motions of a sacrament. Yeah. If, if, even if I bless your marriage with a whole uh, bucket of holy water, it's not that that will make it a sacrament. What will make it a sacrament is your response of love to the love of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And you don't always presuppose that, that that is really happening at the sacrament. That is why we have annulments. Is that right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. When, when, when we introduce a process of annulment, it means in all humility, the couple is admitting that maybe there is no marriage that took place from the very start. Mm -hmm. There was no bond. So you, you cannot say what God has joined together. Maybe it's not God who joined you together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when it is not God who joined you together, don't force it, you know, because uh, you are committing a sin just by forcing something that is not from God, you know. I, I hope you get what I mean, yes. you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's very liberating for some couples, you know. Oh. That is why some couples have to be accompanied, you know. 
Mm. I have met some couples who are saying, you know, um, I, yeah, I, I cannot get out of this marriage because, because, uh, uh, because I might commit a sin because, uh, you know, I was married in church, but I never loved him from the start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, really? Mm -hmm. You know, how can you call it a marriage if you never loved from the start? It is the foundation of it. So it means there is no marriage that took place. Mm. That is why, you know, uh, in, we have uh, matrimonial tribunals. First of all, you know, when, when a marriage is in crisis, we always try to save it. You know? mm -hmm. The ones we sent are, are counselors, you know, because maybe there was no love at the start, but you grew in love in the process. You know that... That happened with my grandparents, you know. I remember one time I was giving a recollection and, and I mentioned about, about this, you know, that there are loveless marriages that were never really sacramentally consummated. Yeah, there, there was a ritual that took place, but the sacrament was really not valid. If there was no mutuality, if there was no, uh, if people were just forced into marriage. You know, my grandmother, she came to me and she felt, you know, really alarmed. He said, you mean to say my marriage with your grandfather was invalid? And I said, why are you asking me that, Lola? And she said, because it was just arranged by my parents. Um, I didn't even know him. It was like that before. Um, it, was, mm -hmm. it was arranged by... Okay. I see. So are you telling me that my marriage was invalid? I said, I'm sorry to say yes when it happened. But let me ask you, Lola, did you ever, at the, in the process, learn to love my grandfather? She said, of course. He said, of course. And, and said, when, uh, when can you say uh, that uh, you uh, really uh, fell in love already with, with my grandfather? Well, I think after the third child already, she said. <laughs> wow. wow. He, he, he had to court me because I really didn't know him, you know. And, and then in the process, I got to know him and then I got to love him, he said. And I said, don't worry. The moment you learn to love him, then that invalid marriage became validated, I said. Right, right. It is your love that validates that marriage, mm -hmm. I said. Mm -hmm. It is when you learn to love, as Jesus Christ has loved you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this, this is something that's so intricate theologically that some people are not aware of it. It's like they always say, because I was married, you know, in the sacrament, I am I'm, I'm, I'm bound to it, you know, like that. But wait a minute, what are you talking about? It depends. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends if you there really is a marriage that mm -hmm. took place. Okay. Bishop, what, how, would, what, how would you respond to people who would say, oh, there you go. Then maybe I could use this as, as an excuse to get out of a marriage that, that is failing. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, um, marriage is not just a feeling, by the way. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. it, yeah, well, 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 many people commit a mistake about love, love as a feeling. You know? It's like mm -hmm. uh, when they don't feel like it, they get out of it. You know? Love is an act of the will. Love is an act of the will. I remember, um, you know, I, I used to say that to seminarians because one time there was a seminarian who didn't want to go to morning prayers because he did not feel like it. He says, you know, I, it's, it's like, why will I go to Mass if I am just spiritually absent? Uh, uh, I think I should go only when I am spiritually indisposed for it, you know. And I said, oh, wait a minute. I said, um, you remember when you were a baby, you know? Uh, do you think at each time that your parents had to wake up to change your diapers, they felt like it? <laughs> I don't think... It, maybe you, you misunderstand love as just a feeling, you know? Many times there will be no feelings. Sometimes you will feel the contrary, but you have made an act of the will. Yes. You have made a commitment. You rise above your feelings, and in that act of the will, you can face all odds, you know, even the most painful realities, and you are kept together. Wow. So, yeah, uh, I think we, we cannot mistake. It's like, it's not something you fall in love and you fall out of love. <laughs> you know, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah. Um, love is uh, the foundation of our faith, you know. Um, and uh, we don't love just with our human love. To be Christian is to allow our human love to grow into the divine love of Christ. Mm-hmm. Don't we say that in our devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus? Right. Uh, o sacred heart, O love divine, do keep us near to thee and make our hearts so like to thine that we may wholly be. Meaning, Lord, I know I am capable of loving as a human being, but my tendency as a human being is to love only when I am loved. Uh, you know, it's like I always demand reciprocity. But teach me to love like, like you. To love with the love of Christ. That is the commandment, remember? My commandment to you is just this. Love each other, love one another as Christ has loved you. To love each other with the love of Christ. And that love of Christ is what is symbolized by the cross. You know? yes, right. The readiness for self-sacrifice. The readiness to give up your life for the one you love. Then when you love with that love, it's no longer just you. It's God at work in you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any questions? No. Um, I no, thought there was no. a question. Uh, oh, um, I, I would like to apologize to the, the folks who have questions. We ran out of question. Uh, we ran out of time. Um, uh, Mr. Dan you? Alvarado, I apologize. We'll, we'll get back to you in, when we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, Bishop, thank you for teaching us, at least for Ma, Jude and me as married couple, and enlightening couples who are listening, that uh, when Jesus suffered and died for us, the covenant, the, the marital bed of Jesus is the cross. And that's self-emptying. Mm-hmm. And the marital bed of the husband and wife is that. It is sacrifice. So we always look at the cross so that we can pattern our ministry from the cross. And then for marriage not to be a feeling, it is a, the word, key words there I learned today is commitment. And then if we are in this ministry, it means we're disciples. So there's discipline because there will be times just like those, especially those people whom we see in the Philippines with grand weddings. There's not a problem with grand wedding. There's not a problem with spending thousands and thousands of pesos, but the problem there is the question is, are you ready for marriage? Because you're not always pretty every day. One day you realize, why did I marry this man? Why did I marry this woman? I'm starting to not like him. I'm starting to not like her. I don't think I can live with him or her for the rest of my lifetime. And then realize you just had this YouTube or Facebook. Everybody knew about it. So to us, for at least for couples who have been like Jude and me 22 years, marriage wasn't always pretty. It was not always happy. The, the hardship was more than the good. But the thing is, if we anchor ourselves with prayer and faith, getting to know our marriage through Jesus, then I think we can do it up until the time, uh, until death do us part. Right. And I think also the healing balm of marriage is when we go to this beautiful sacrament of confession. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, I can never emphasize this sacred balm that soothes our marriage uh, other than the sac- sacrament of confession. Mm-hmm. I always tell the empowerers who visit us here to try to do your best weekly, if possible, to go to confession because only then you will realize when you come home, you are as pure, you're like born again. And and I cannot emphasize that po sa mga nakikinig sa ito. I know we have spent over time. Please, please do your best to go to confession as much as you can. Ask your priest. Ask Bishop Mbo. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do it. Yeah. I'm sorry. But yun lang po. Yeah. It, okay, go ahead. Like, like Father Calloway said, uh, if they only knew about the sacrament of confession, right? Yes, if they only yeah. knew. But right. uh, I love it. I love what you said, uh, Bishop Mbo, and this and then we'll conclude, uh, that the, the, the covenant oath between a husband and a wife, the bond is, is Christ's love. And how can you dissolve Christ's love? Yeah, I love Isn't that. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Um, uh, but there's no such thing as uh, happy ever after, right? I mean, you can be happy all the time, but you can always have joy in your marriage. Joy. 
Uh, Bishop, where can they find what we wanted oh. to? Uh, we've read your books. They're beautiful These books. Are the, this is where, where can they work? This is your latest book called Yeshua. Yes. Um, where can they find these books? And these are the, the prior ones. We, we there's, don't there's have one missing. I yeah. Yeah, I don't think we have it. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> oh, I, I make sure you get that too. It's the gospel of love. It's so awesome. we started with the gospel of mercy, the, then the second, the gospel of love. Which is not yeah. here. Mm -hmm. and, then, yeah. and then the third is the gospel of hope. And then, and then the fourth is Yeshua, son of man. Yeshua, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's Yeshua. Uh, getting to meet Jesus Christ uh, up close in his humanity. Where yes. can they buy your books, Bishop? Yes. We, we have a Facebook page, The Storyteller Society Incorporated. And all the instructions are there on how to obtain, uh, you know, the, there is all, we, we also have uh, what they call this digital copies. Uh, mm -hmm. They are available if you cannot get the hard copy. Um, but the hard copies are obtainable through Lazada here in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, I do not know yet how a hard copy can be obtained by people overseas like yourselves, you know. But uh, the, you can get the Google uh, read, you know, the... the the digital copy, yes. Right, it is right. also available online. Yeah. Wow. So the story, the Storytellers Society Incorporated. Storytellers Story Society, Society Incorporated. incorporated. Yes. Oh, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah. You, you will see that in, in the book itself, in Yeshua, Son of Man. The mm -hmm. publisher is the Storytellers Society Incorporated. Right. It, is, it is right the, at the back of the book. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. That's and it. We, and yeah. we have, you can check the website, yeah, and the Facebook page as well, yeah. Okay, and we've been honored. We had some shift here in America, and I always tell the theologians whom we had guested at Coffee Conversations, the book that you have in your hand is limited. Seriously, I think in America, I don't know Bishop, but mm -hmm. at least in Washington State, the ones that had arrived here in Bonnie Lake, Washington, are the only copies here. Yeah. So, yes. We are the official and the only <laughs> distributor. The <laughs> supplier. <laughs> Wala po kami ano, we don't gain any monetary currency it goes up there right, right, right. <laughs> so, okay. yeah okay yeah. so bishop uh for everyone this is a shirt that i received we received from uh yung pong mga sheep the bishops uh diocese of Caloocan. it says i stand with bishop ambo and you know the story in the diocese of Caloocan where he shepherds the sheep of his the sheep the his flock who are marginalized mm -hmm. yeah and so you know Therese, that was when i was charged criminally mm -hmm. uh of uh, sedition uh, inciting to sedition obstruction obstruction of justice uh in the context of our work you know for the protection of uh, the families uh, of uh, victims of extrajudicial killings uh, and that was when they produced that that uh, t-shirt and Praise the Lord, the charges have been dropped, yes. meaning they, they've all been dismissed. And uh, yeah. we, we thank all the people who really supported us morally and spiritually. Yeah. Right. Yes. Thank you for what you do, Bishop, for all the sheep. You can, I, I did not imagine there were 2.1 million people in Kalookan. You know, the, the population in Seattle is 750 something thousand. And, and we have a lot of people, uh, uh, men of cloth working, but you have... Two million, two point one million. Did you say people? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So triple, triple the yes, yes, Washington yes. State. Wow, wow. No, no, Seattle. No, triple, Seattle. The tri triple the Seattle. Yeah, Seattle. Uh -oh. It's Bishop's diocese. Yes, yes. Okay. Anyway, okay you want to ask? So, ito po, ito po yung, I was just reading it for marriage. If you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes a sacrifice. It's in mm -hmm. their bath, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes a sacrifice. So it's just a, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Bishop, for your time. You know, there's so much more that we can talk about. I mean, I remember those nights where we'd talk and talk and talk and just, just so much and then realize it's late at night when you hosted us in the Philippines. Um, hopefully one day, Paul, we can have you back. Yeah, yeah. but in the meantime, Bishop, uh, prayers, our prayers shall be with you. Uh, for all our listeners, please pray for uh, Bishop Ambo. Please pray for our bishops. Please pray for our uh, priests. They are like us. They need prayers. That's they true. need prayers. Um, Bishop, can we ask for your um, abstract blessings? Okay. Uh, 
before I do that, I would like to pray over you as you celebrate your 22nd wedding. Oh, thank, you, oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, dear God, loving Father, for this uh, wonderful conversation. I ask in a very special way at this very moment to please pour out your blessing on Jude and Therese as they celebrate the 22nd anniversary of their entry into the sacrament of uh, matrimony. Dear Lord, we know that they love each other, but more importantly, we know that you love them and that the bond that keeps them together is the love of your son, Jesus Christ. Allow them to continue to grow in love, in the love of Jesus Christ, as members of the body of Christ, the church, participating in the life and mission of the church in their capacities. Dear Lord, protect them and their families, especially Zach and Sky. Protect them from all kinds of harm, danger, accidents, and illness, continue to make them into efficient and effective uh, ministers of the word the way you are doing it right now to empower Philippines in the coffee conversations. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father Amen. and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you, Paul. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Paul, again. <laughs> yes, give, my regards to, uh, give my regards to Sky and Zach, okay? Well, yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, I love you, Paul. Paul. I love Paul. you, Paul. Bye-bye. And bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye to all the followers. Thank you, Paul. That was, that was awesome. I'm sorry. I really apologize to all the listeners who might have had questions. Um, uh, we promise we will bring Bishop Ambo back and, um, and we will entertain the questions. We, will, we promise we will make time. I apologize. But in the meantime, you want to make an announcement about who our next guest is? Um, Dr. Edward Sri. Dr. Edward Sri. And this is this same time, right? Yeah, Friday? Time. Yeah. No. Right. Friday at um, six. It's six p.m. here, so it's nine a.m. AM your time. Next, Next Friday, nine a.m. Yes, but for yung pong na mga nagtanong about for Bishop Ambo, then it gives us an, another reason to invite Bishop Ambo yeah. again, of yeah. which hopefully he will oblige and say yes to yeah. again. Um, yeah. Yeah. God right. bless you guys. So uh, it will be next week. Maraming salamat po and God bless you. God bless you. <laughs>